Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to the Hindu News for Analysis for today. Before we begin, again reminding you, we are now on Telegram. Make sure that you join the Telegram channel using the link given in the description of the video, where you will get all the latest current affairs updates about the UPSC examination. Now let's begin. The first article that we want to discuss here is about a recent meeting that was held on global counter-terrorism approach that was convened by India. Now, as you know, for the month of December 2022, India is holding the presidency of UNSC. So, India right now is a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. As you know, the presidency of the UN Security Council changes every single month. So, for the month of December, India is the president of the UNSC. Because of which India has recently convened a briefing on global counter-terrorism approach. Now, this is not the first time India has taken such an initiative. As you know, India, unfortunately, remains one of those nations in the world that have been impacted by terrorism very, very frequently, mainly because of our neighborhood. That is why India has been extremely active in taking up this matter at the UN Security Council and at the UN General Assembly as well. Although, unfortunately, we have not had the kind of support, especially from our neighborhood, that we had expected earlier. In this meeting also, the agenda of India was actually to ensure that the entire world comes together on the issue of counter-terrorism. On the other hand, we saw Pakistan's foreign minister actually making statements on India's internal matters that did not go down well with the Indian side. Our foreign minister, Sri S. Jayashankar, has listed four key hurdles for better counter-terrorism cooperation around the entire world. He says that there are certain states that support financing terror. For example, Pakistan has been on the grey list of the FATF specifically for this reason only, that their government is not being able to stop money flowing into terrorist groups. Then, our foreign minister also pointed out towards some multilateral mechanisms that are opaque and agenda-driven. So, for various nations, there are different definitions of terrorism that have come up. Pakistan, for example, has usually pointed out that there are good terrorists and there are bad terrorists. People who actually support Pakistan state's agenda are considered as good terrorists, while the others who actually harm the Pakistan establishment themselves are called bad terrorists. Meaning that the states around the entire world actually support certain terrorist groups based on what their agenda is. Saudi Arabia, for example, accuses Iran of supporting a lot of these terrorist groups, and Iran does the same kind of thing for Saudi Arabia and Israel. Our foreign minister also talked about double standards and politicization of counter-terrorism according to where terror groups belong. So terror groups that belong to, let's say, Pakistan, the Pakistan military does not view them as any threat. On the other hand, any terror groups that belong to some other parts of the country, for Pakistan, they become bad terror groups all of a sudden. All these are hurdles pointed out by our foreign minister, which the entire world is facing right now in fighting against terrorism. This special meeting that was convened by India also had a point of discussion on China. India said that most of the P5 nations right now are driven by their own agenda. For example, China has blocked India's initiative multiple times of designating some of the Pakistan-based terrorists as global terrorists. Whenever we try to give a global terrorist designation, to some of the terrorists from Lashkar Taiba or Jaish e Mohammed, China usually blocks it, saying that we have not given enough evidence. In fact, instead of uniting on India's proposal of, let's say, 1996, when India proposed Comprehensive Convention on International Terror to institute global practices of countering terror, the P5 nations even then could not come together. You would see multiple reports of how people around the world are almost fed up of the P5, that is, the permanent members of the Security Council, because most of them have been using their veto powers to suit their own agenda. You know very well that whenever there is a resolution introduced against any of the P5 nations or their friends, one of the P5 nations will use their veto. China uses a veto to favor Pakistan. USA uses a veto to favor nations such as Israel. Russia uses a veto to favor themselves or to favor nations such as Syria or Libya, so on and so forth. In the end, we have the UN Security Council, which was supposed to be a body to counter terror and to ensure world peace, not being able to work even on basic issues and not being able to come together on issues that are harming the entire world. Now, over here, I would also like to point out that Indian government specifically 
has taken multiple initiatives in the past few years to counter terrorism, especially in India. For example, we have set up the joint working group on counter terrorism or security matters with multiple nations around the world. There are bilateral treaties on mutual legal assistance in criminal matters, where India is a part of these treaties with many nations, where we exchange information about how to catch criminals, to track the proceeds of the crimes, etc. In 2018, India highlighted its demand for comprehensive convention on international terrorism at the UN General Assembly. That was after the 1996 demand that we just discussed, where India wanted a global comprehensive legal framework to counter terrorism. Our objectives that we have specially pointed out in the UN are to ban all terror groups and shut down all the terror camps, to identify a universal definition of terrorism so that no country can actually argue against that, to prosecute all the terrorists under special laws, to make cross-terrorism an extradable offense worldwide, meaning that if there is a terrorist who has done some illegal thing in India and irrespective of wherever that terrorist is hidden around the entire world, irrespective of the extradition treaty being in place or not, the terrorist should be extradited. India has also addressed a UN high-level conference on heads of counter-terrorism in 2018. In 2021, at the 20th anniversary of the UNSC Resolution 1373, India again pointed out towards an action plan which should be implemented to fight against terrorism because this remains a global threat and not just a national threat. Internally within India also, there have been multiple laws that have been passed to fight against terrorism. We have the UAPA of 1967 that has been made more and more stringent to deal with terrorist activities. We have also formed the NIA, the National Investigation Agency, which is India's counter-terrorism task force to deal with terror-related crimes. We have also launched a policy of zero tolerance against terrorism and various counter-terrorism operations have been taken place within the country, including Operation Rakshak, Operation Sarp Vinash and Operation All Out. We should be glad to acknowledge that because of these initiatives and a lot of stringent laws being passed in the country, the frequency of terrorist activities, at least within the country, has declined considerably. The next article that we have here is about the ongoing 30-day Kashi Tamil Sangamam that is taking place in the world-renowned city of Varanasi. Now, as you know, the union government recently announced that they will be working on Ek Bharat Shreshth Bharat scheme. This was a scheme launched by the government of India a few years back, under which the intention of the government was that amongst the states in India, we should pair up different states. Let's say Gujarat, West Bengal, or let's say Punjab, Kerala. These kind of pairings should be done so that the states can exchange each other's culture, each other's cuisine, each other's mannerisms, etc. So that people can come closer to each other's states and there can be a feeling of unity amongst the entire country. Under this initiative, the government of India has tried to bring together two centers of Hinduism that have been regarded very, very highly by historians and philosophers around the entire world, that is Tamil Nadu and Kashi, also known as Varanasi. As a part of this program, the government of India has invited participants from Tamil Nadu in large numbers to come and visit Varanasi and take part in this ongoing program. The participants will travel not just to Varanasi, but also to Sarnath, Ayodhya and Prayagraj over six days. There have been multiple examples of ancient philosophers from South India visiting Kashi and other parts in North India, especially for their philosophical learnings. There have been philosophers such as Ramanuj Acharya, who travelled to Kashi and expanded his spiritual learnings. We also have Tenkasi and Sevakasi temples in Tamil Nadu, which are said to be inspired from Varanasi's Kashi Vishuna temple after the Pandya king Adhivir Ram Pandyan went on a pilgrimage to Varanasi. There is also a tradition in Tamil Brahmin weddings that a groom usually first embarks on a yatra to Kashi or to Varanasi before he is actually called back to marry the bride. So there is a lot of historical and spiritual connection between the two sides. If you have been to Varanasi or if you actually go to Varanasi, you will see the places nearby the Kashi Vishwana temple. The number of people who actually visit there, it is actually filled with a lot of people coming in from Tamil Nadu especially. And it is my personal experience, I can also tell you, there are a lot of shops that are specially selling food and all those items which are required by people coming in from Tamil Nadu, which also points out towards a deep connection between Tamil Nadu and Varanasi. 
the prime minister addressed this spiritual gathering and said that tamil is the oldest language in the world he also released a translation of thirukkural in 13 languages and announced that a chair dedicated to tamil poet subramaniam bharti or bhartiyar would be set up at the banaras hindu university this ongoing kashi tamil sangamam was proposed by a high powered committee in order to promote indian languages as per the government this event would fulfill multiple objectives not only would it bring two very different cultures close to each other not only would it actually improve the concept of cooperative federalism in india it would also be on the lines of the national education policy as you know the national education policy of 2020 has envisaged integration of indian knowledge systems and spreading it across the entire country rather than being dependent on the western education systems all the time i also wanted to give you a bit of detail about the ek bharat shreshth bharat scheme that came into being in 2015 with the idea of promoting engagement amongst different people amongst different states and union territories across the entire country because unlike any other country india is highly highly diverse when you go to nations such as us uk france germany you would not see a lot of differences between the people living in different parts of those countries while when you travel in india within one single country you will see people having so many distinct languages culture the manner of living is very 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 different and that is why in india this actually deserves a special mention it is the ministry of education that has been given the responsibility to ensure that the scheme becomes a success under this scheme every state or union territory would be paired with another state or a union territory for some time period and they would be expected to engage with each other through exchange of language festivals cultural events tourism etc the objective is to ensure that people across the country thrive in our diversity to promote the spirit of national integration showcase india's rich culture heritage customs tradition and also create long term engagements between people of different states The next article that we have here is on Japan. Now Japan has now gone ahead and changed its very old defense policy in view of China's aggressive stand in the past few decades. Now let me give you a bit of background about what exactly has happened and why is it so so significant. See when you read world history you usually close your chapter of the second world war by reading that an atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and then Japan surrendered. but the story does not end there what happened after that in the next few years is also very very significant so what happened after that was that the american forces did not leave japan the american forces or the american government to say was so skeptical that if we leave japan right now japan would now start to think about taking revenge from us just like what happened after first world war after first world war when germany was defeated the other western nations thought that this is the end of the war This is what gave a chance to people such as Hitler to come to power and again start preparing for another war. The western nations especially the US did not want the scene to happen in Japan. So for many years after the Japanese surrendered in the second world war the American military actually remained in Japan. Now what they did was they actually decided to make a new constitution for Japan. So Japan was given a new constitution altogether after the second world war and that constitution was mainly made by America the people that American government had actually sent to Japan so this constitution of Japan as we see today it won't be wrong if we say that this is the constitution made by America or imposed by America only that is why you see a lot of similarities between the Japanese and the American constitution even today Now the most interesting part of that constitution is there is an article that is article number 9 which says that Japan government will never engage in any war. Now this is a very very unique kind of a proposition where the constitution itself says that the government will never engage in a war. That is why Japan does not have an army, does not have a military. They do have their forces but they are called Japanese self defense forces. So the idea is if someone else comes in to attack us then we will prevent that attack we will defend ourselves but we will not start the war that's a very interesting provision that was inserted by the americans especially because they did not want japan to start a war again now that is what japan's defense policy has been based on defense policy of japan has always been of non interference because they have been given a kind of a security guarantee by us that if something wrong happens we will come to defend you but you don't deal with any of these matters so japan has remained aloof in these matters but interestingly in the last decade or so this has changed 
in the last decade or so with the rise of China and China threatening as many nations in its neighborhood as possible, Japanese also are now worried about that. And now in this context, this news is very, very important. The Japanese government has approved a major defense policy change, saying that now their security spending will be increased to 2% of their GDP by 2027, which is a huge jump for a country which is not very big in size. Now, many people in Japan also promote this idea. Many people in Japan have been saying that the government should change our policy. We are now facing a lot of challenges. We can't just depend on USA to give us a security guarantee. On the other hand, there are some people in Japan, there are some political parties who are not really happy with this. They say that their old defense policy of not interfering and not being assertive enough was better. China, on the other hand, knows that this is pointed towards them. So Chinese government has also issued a statement saying that Japan should actually reflect on its policies. So it's a very, very important change that has happened in the Indo-Pacific. This was the article I was talking about, article number 9. It's a provision in the National Constitution of Japan which outlaws war, meaning that Japanese government cannot engage in a war. That is why they can only have self-defense forces. Now, you might say that does it not mean that Japan can amend its own constitution? It can. Article 96 of the Japanese constitution gives the power to the parliament to amend the constitution of Japan, although it's very difficult because in Japan, the constitution process is that both the houses of the parliament, that is diet as it is called, would have to first pass the bill by special majority and then they would have to hold a referendum and more than half of the voters would also have to say yes. So far in the history of Japan, there have been zero constitutional amendments, absolutely zero. Meaning that Japan still has the same constitution given to it by the US. They have interpreted some articles differently. That is how they right now have their self-defense forces. They have been giving them more and more powers. Earlier, Japan did not even used to participate in any military exercises. But now, as you know, even with India, they do have military exercises. So they have interpreted it slightly differently, but they have still not changed their constitution. There have been zero amendments in the Japanese constitution even till today. Now, I also wanted to tell you that this change in Japan's security policy is not overnight. Many people have been seeing it coming over the past few years. Go back to 2014. 2014 was a time that Japan, after a long, long time, decided that we will now be exporting weapons. Because under this policy, Japan did not export any weapons. They used to make their own weapons. They used to get some weapons from US also for their own security. But they did not used to export weapons. But in 2014, with the rise of China, Japan decided that they can't just remain neutral and they have to engage in good relationships with other nations as well. In fact, Japan offered to India its US-2 amphibious aircraft. Not just this, they even offered to make that in India and give it to the Indian Navy. Amphibious aircraft means aircraft that can land on water also and that can land on land as well. However, due to a long delay in the permissions and everything else that is related to it, permissions have still not been given and this setup has still not started making planes in India. But at least Japan offering India to export certain weapons, Japan offering that we will set up the manufacturing in India was also a big, big departure from their decades old policy of banning export of weapons. The next important article is that the crude oil import for India has risen by over 52% to $147 billion just in the months from April to November. Now, as you know, the Commerce Ministry has given these numbers, not just about crude oil. They've also given numbers about coke, coal, etc., which has also increased. Gold imports, on the other hand, have decreased, thankfully. Vegetable oil imports also increased by 16.7%. Now, this is not a new thing. These kind of numbers are usually released time and time again by the Commerce Ministry. Over here, one other thing of importance that I want to discuss is the concept of windfall tax. As you can see, the government of India has decided to cut down windfall tax from crude oil output. Now, before we do that, also just an important reminder of how India has actually diversified the countries from which we buy crude oil. As you all would have noticed, ever since the Ukraine-Russia war began, and Russia has had to face multiple sanctions from the foreign nations, India 
has been taking advantage of the situation because Russia has agreed to sell us crude oil at a discounted price. That is why it is said that our crude oil imports from Russia has increased by close to 16 times. Russia is now the third largest crude oil exporter to India and the two sides, largely in terms of crude oil only, have increased their trade just in the months from April to August to close to 16 and a half billion dollars. Most of it is made up of crude oil only. Also, India is not the only country that is buying crude oil from Russia. You can see in this graph, China is also taking advantage of the same. But the one key difference here is, or in fact, two differences here are, number one, with China, the Western nations always expected this. China has always been much more closer to Russia as compared to the Western nations. With India, the Western nation thought that they would be able to convince India not to buy so much oil from Russia. The second point here to notice, if you can see the graph, it's not that China earlier was not buying oil from Russia. Even before the war, they were buying oil almost in the same quantity from Russia. India, on the other hand, before the Ukraine-Russia war had begun, actually was buying negligible amount of oil from Russia. Now, that has changed considerably. That is why it has always been a center of debate. Whenever there is any conference where India and Western nations are taking part, you see this question being risen time and time again by the Western nations. And India has answered this very well by saying that it is our national interest that we will take into consideration. And also, Europe also is buying enough gas and oil from Russia. So we do not need any lessons on that. Now, I want to discuss with you the idea of windfall taxes. Now, what is a windfall tax? See, windfall tax is usually imposed by the government when government thinks that price of a commodity has declined considerably in the international market and thus it would give huge amounts of profits to the companies without the companies doing anything about it. It's not that the company has made any new development. The company has not made any new invention. But just because of what has been happening in the international market, the price of crude oil has decreased. So companies will automatically have a lot of profit to ensure that companies alone don't take part in the profit. And government also gets a part of that profit. A new tax is imposed, which is called the windfall tax. It is usually done for a short period of time. It is done for that time period till the time that the price of the commodity in the international market remains low. There have been different reasons given by the government to introduce this kind of a tax. The government says that we don't want just the companies to actually gain from this. Government should also gain taxes so that it can be used to fund social welfare schemes and it can be a supplementary revenue stream for the government. It is usually imposed in terms of crude oil and gas only. The price of crude oil, gas, etc. has seen a sharp decline. It reached its peak soon after the war had started. But in the months of August, September, the crude oil prices started to decline because of it, the government imposed windfall taxes because the government also needed more money after their economic downfall in COVID-19 crisis. Now that the international market is seeing crude oil prices coming up once again because of the price cap on the Russian oil being imposed by the Western nations, government has now decided to again take back the windfall tax on the crude oil because now we think that the prices are increasing so the companies don't have to pay these prices to the government altogether. These are the important articles from the Hindu newspaper today. Now a couple of practice questions. Number one, events such as the Kashi Tamil Sangamam can go a long way in strengthening cooperative federalism in India. Elaborate. Second, a shift in Japan's security policy may have long-term consequences on the region's status quo. Do you agree? Critically analyze. Both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video. Have a good day ahead.